Okay, so as I add on the assignments, you're going to see an assignment sheet that will basically take you to the uh, the page, and then Canvas crashes on me, but um, it's not going to let me back in. That will allow you to download the model. Um, if there is a drawing available, I will include the drawing, and you can create your own model if you would like to. Uh, otherwise, use, and it didn't complete. Okay, so hold on. All right, so we'll grab the, um, the the download. If it had completed, it would have gone into my downloads folder. You should have a projects folder somewhere with um, uh, that you're going to accumulate these these files. Uh, so probably the only thing that I would request is that you push you rename this and put your initials in the the, the part name somewhere. Um, most of the time, I'm I'm pulling off a of canvas. I'm going to put this in a folder on Google Drive for you and share that folder back to you so that you are looking at the same information that I looked at. If there was a file mismatch or you uh, resubmitted us an assignment and I missed it, then there's kind of some traceability back through the system that um, uh, we can we can go back and pick up the, the same file. Um, my, um, my laptop is a commercial version so it comes up and says this file was created in education version and that's okay we are doing instructions so that would that should work um, the universal tooling plate is kind of a uh, just a really basic um, um, drill and uh, tap routine but we still have some some decisions to make so um, <clears throat> pretty much the design the uh, the associativity comes from the features that we've created in SOLIDWORKS if I change the dimensions I change the size then um, uh, HSM has the capability of seeing that change and going through and updating the uh, the toolpaths. So this is launching. We have the uh, the cam pull down, and out of the um, or, I'm sorry the, the cam tab on the uh, the command manager, and then we have on the uh, the properties the cam properties. So on the um, the command manager we're going to have the the basic functionality. And there's no toolpath simulation, anything to work with. So those first items are going to be grayed out. Uh, one of the things we can do is go look at the uh, the tool library, since this one should be fairly fresh. And it's going to be open documents, assign uh, assignment one, YouTube, uh, universal tooling plate. And we'll go through and we'll kind of pick out which ones, um, which ones we want. So this does have a carryover because usually all of these are checked. Um, but what ends up uh, ends up happening is we really only need uh, maybe the aluminum, all right? So inch aluminum uh, holders, I'm not really worried about. And then this ANSI taps tool is one that I downloaded that I will make available to you. So by default in um, the uh, the all tools and by type, we go to a um, a tap drill. Or I'm sorry um, to the taps right hand. We're going to get a list, and it's going to be mostly, well, maybe not mostly uh, metric, um, but the uh, the one that I added uh, puts in all of the um, the ANSI uh, inch taps. Uh, so we'll we'll have to talk about where that is uh, is located, where you need to put it to uh, to have access to it. Um, since each of these is a folder, nope, don't want to delete it. I was going to check and see if it would launch it directly into Windows and take us there. Um, but it's going to be under the HSM M folder. We just have to navigate down to it. Um, so tools, um, any drill, pretty much um, selections. So um, spot drills picks up the, uh, the taps again because they're under the, the drill category. Mm, that doesn't see. Oh, there we go. Then we get into all the fractional, the letter drills. Um, if the met metric drills are active, then they would um, they would show up as well. So I could come down to metric for uh, metric for aluminum. No, well, I probably don't want to do. Oh, there we go. If I activate that one, now my any drills also includes. Well, if we can find them. Oh, there they are, all of the metric, at least um, in between. So if you're going to use something, we can turn it on, turn it off uh, as needed. So this tap CNC, that may be why I'm getting duplicates. Let me turn that one off. 
and we'll go back down to where we can see the taps. <clears throat> now it's still kind of kind of duplicating out there, so I'm not sure which ones need to be on. All right, so anyway, tap to ANSI is going to be the inch, and taps ISO are going to be our um, our metric drills. So let me switch back out of that. I'm going to go back to the category for the right hand uh, taps, and then we'll turn on the the taps ISO. And so two two millimeters by 0.4, 3.5 by 0.6. Those are going to start showing up now. All right. So 2018, uh, 2017 or 2018, they added the uh, the taps. Um, it used to be only metric, so that was why this database was created and used um, uh, I've been using it for a while all right so pretty much what is happening in this assignment kind of jumping back and forth between those two things is that this is the accumulation of everything that falls into a flat flat mill description so if I come down to the um, uh, the inch tools and any mill these are all described as any mills, and then this is kind of a, a subcategory. I can pull from this folder and the sample libraries to get my library started. Um, or since it's it's being activated here as the inch aluminum versus inch brass, inch whatever, we could have as many as four or five of each, but the feeds and speeds will be different for brass they'll be different for aluminum they'll be different for steels all right so it's kind of one of those pick the one that you're using the most if you're running predominantly stainless steel or uh, 1018 the low carbon steels high carbon steels that kind of stuff pick one of those so you're not seeing five or six duplicate end mills five or six duplicate everything all right so um, in this case, um, let's see, I have the uh, the inch aluminum, I click brass, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the uh, the metric aluminum and kind of simplify this down to where the um, the items in my sample libraries that are showing up underneath these folders because they are designated as drills or designated as mills, that when I come into the by type and go to filter for flat end mills, I have a reasonable amount of data to choose from instead of tons and tons. All right, so if you're seeing a big long list in here, um, my my point, the long way around to the uh, um, to to my point is that come down to these libraries and make sure that just a few things are selected. You don't need everything turned on. Okay, and then as far as the assignment, or I'm sorry, the assign one, I can preload this. But the probably the better process is to create a um, uh, create the tool list as you go, unless you have a standard library. So um, going into tool crib uh, a tool crib method is that if we have one of the side mount tool changers on our machine, and I'm going to load the first ten tools into that um, tool changer, and they're going to stay there. So Tool one is always going to be a half inch end mill. Tool two is always going to be uh, three eighths, quarter, eighth inch, uh, three sixteenths, eighth, eighth inch, um, a fly cutter, an engraving tool, um, you know, something, something, whatever your favorite tools are. Get the first eight to ten in there. Then I would come down to a my libraries, and under this I would load up my tool crib, and then I could bring those ten tools directly into the assignment and whether I use them or not they are reserved I can go directly to them and say I want tool one it's set up for this machine it has an RPM that works in it we're moving through the um, uh, through to the next process All right, so I can kind of manipulate depending on your on your structure so it's kind of one of our first first choices is are we going to um, go with the uh, the carousel style which is not as um, does not lend itself as well to preloading, uh, mainly because the tool change is uh, one tool goes comes out of the spindle, goes into the carousel, carousel indexes, comes back, gets the next tool. 
and the side mount arm comes down and swaps and it's a uh, it's a faster process that lends itself more to having a tool crib set up and living inside the machine so that's not to say that i wouldn't put it in the carousel it's just not as not as convenient all right so if i set up that carousel then um, i would have that exist under a um, uh, it, under my library um, because of the folder settings because of the um, uh, the way that this um, manages, um, I'm not going to be edit, able to edit tools out of these items directly, um, but I can edit in my libraries. All right, so um, that's one I'll have to see if they've changed any of the read-only or uh, read-write uh, permissions for those uh, for those folders. So a lot of a lot of information stored back in the uh, the tool library, and um, you know, it's kind of a, a good place to, to start is to know where you're going to be selecting the tools from and kind of the basic structure because, you know, again, there is a lot of information in there and you may see, um, you know, five of these. Why do I have five half inch end mills? I don't need five half inch. And, and obviously you don't. You can go and check those. Um, task manager, show task manager. Uh, that should be a box that pops up since there's no tasks. I guess I'm not going to get the task manager. Um, drilling, drill, uh, drill wizard, drill, and manual NC. Um, pretty much the drill wizard will combine up items, but I find it just as easy to um, say that I want to form a drill operation and have it do the tap drill and then go back and do a second drill operation rather than managing the drill wizard. All right, so I'm going to have to play with that in 2018 because it falls in that category of I struggled with it the last time, a couple of times that I used it, and it didn't work the way I expected to it, so I got uh, frustrated with it and just went back to what I know. Well, that's that's really not an acceptable excuse. I need to go back and, and beat up on it a little bit more and see if um, uh, the issues that I had with it were operator error or something that's been corrected in the software. 2D milling. Let's see if we get the pull down. So facing, 2D adaptive clearing, pockets, contours, slots, threads, circular, uh, bores, traces, 2D chamfer, and engrave. To start off with, we're going to do the, uh, the facing operation and some contours, and then we'll build up from there into the other items and what they do, how they do it. 3D mill is about the, the same. Um, the one I'm... Uh, uh, as part of the assignments is kind of figuring out where that jumping off point will be where we can do at least one three axis project and you see how it works or multi axis um, since we have the capabilities for fourth and fifth axis um, setting up for those contours and um, being able to, to go through those um, those operations. Um, turning has been one of if you look on any of the uh, the forms the Autodesk forms for HSM Turning has been a um, kind of an ongoing running battle of the in the ID operations. The logic is kind of clunky. In fact, it's downright a pain to use. Um, the outside, the profiling operations, the uh, the OD operations work fine, but because of the the strategy that they've chosen to set their retract and clearance planes. Um, it's it's um, it's not as uh, functional. The um, the ID operations are not as functional as they could be. So we'll have a turning operation in or a turning project in our assignments, and we'll see how far we get with it. Whatever I can do, I will expect you to do. If I can't get it to work, then you're you know you're excused from um, having to do that portion or to do the ID. Um, but if I can show you how to do it and give you a good explanation, then you should be able to follow it and generate the, the, um, the tool pass. Job is what we're going to start with. And so um, rather than coming up to the command manager, I do a lot of this on the right mouse button. And just like SolidWorks, I am heavy, heavy on the right mouse button. You know, so um, we'll look at the setting up the job. Um, creating folders, so kind of grouping operations within a folder is one way of managing more complex uh, items, uh, being able to um, uh, post code for them or not, uh, add them 
Um, and then also the pattern kind of ends up being a folder that uh, if we know what this pattern is, then I can do one and tell it what the rest of the, the operation should be out of the pattern group. So pattern will create a folder and it will suck up the, um, the drill operation or the drill and tap operations uh, to complete out that pattern. Some of the utilities, so pretty much a quick link to get into the sketch will do. We used to do more with the coordinate system, but um, that was one that uh, HSM responded to and improved their picking locations, picking our starting locations. Um, so probably not as not used as much. Um, there are times where maybe out of habit uh, or because it aids in selection, I will go ahead and generate a sketch target. So basically a circle with lines in it to show me the X and Y. Um, just to have a, um, a visual reference of where I'm placing this or in the case where this has a radius on it and my zero zero is actually going to be out here in space. I don't have anything convenient to select for my point of, of, um, of origin, then I'm going to create it. So it's one of those things The I think one of the, um, ex maybe the, uh, the expectations of the modeler is this is going to do everything for me. No cam package does everything for you. Um, the quick views, being able to go through tool views, tool path points. Um, I guess I should use this one more because um, I really don't know what uh, what all of those do. Um, tool front, back, so orientation, those should all uh, pretty much align with, with our SOLIDWORKS. So one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, HSM uh, was a uh, gold partner for SOLIDWORKS. It was geared towards the SOLIDWORKS modeler. Uh, Autodesk bought them in late 2012, and the integration has been into Inventor, into um, Fusion 360 is not called um, is not called HSM. It's called CAM, but it's basically the same uh, operations, maybe minor tweaks to it. Um, and then they've opened it up to other uh, other modelers. I think they're going after that market of if you have parametric model uh, solid body geometry, there's no reason we can't machine to it. It's just living inside of that interface. So speaking of that, when you installed this, uh, when you installed HSM, um, it turned itself on and it, um, it showed up as a command manager tab and added the, um, the property manager for it. Um, but if it's one of those you're not programming or you don't need it, keep in mind that you can come up to the add-ins. And also if it gets turned off and then you can't find it again, you come to the add-ins, you uh, check for HSM. Right now it's checked for the active current system. And then if we don't want it to start up, you uncheck over on the right side and it won't start up with the system. So there's times where I'm just doing heavy design. I don't want it to remind me that HSM can't find something or HSM is looking for something um, or that I'm, I program something. I will uncheck it for the active but let it continue to run with the startup. Or I'll just turn them both off and just when I need it, I'll make it active. So you have, have the choice of, um, uh, of how you're going to interact with the software. Is it always going to come on or is it just going to come on when you want it? Jerry, do you have to have SolidWorks installed before you install HSM? I believe so. Yeah, so um, uh, SolidWorks is being the base, base platform, then HSM, and the Autodesk uh, license is going out and it's looking for what we told it, uh, what we told it we're going to install it with. All right, so um, let's go ahead and uh, set up the job. Um, I guess the other, and we might as well get it out of the way, the other question item of interest is going to be um, upstream data. Since we're the recipients, we're downstream data. Our data is on the manufacturing side. Whatever this part does is engineering. And within our company structure, within our uh, capabilities, are we allowed to uh, modify the original document? So if we're under ISO or we're under PDM, uh, par, uh, document management, um, uh, even though I can, should I? 
All right. So uh, the question is, um, you know, for for you guys, I'm going to say go ahead and modify my part. I don't have a problem with it. But if I have to put in that target sketch or I have to put in a containment sketch or something and the engineering group opens it up and says, who modified that? That's not allowed or, you know, I don't know what that is. And they start deleting things. Next time I open it up, my program is going to fail or show me a bunch of errors. So at this point, at the very start of this, um, uh, the, the programming activity, Am I going to put this in an assembly that is my document related back to their document? Or am I going to work on the single document? All right, so it's, um, you know, this is the time to make that decision. So if, um, if you're going to be in that environment, the recommendation is that uh, before we go any further, we go in, create a new assembly document, assembly inch, and then this file is open. And I'm going to insert it. And if I just hit the check mark, it will insert it back origin to origin. And it's going to warn me again. But now I have assembly one related back to that part. Any sketch, any fixture, anything that I add to this part, it's my document. This is now a manufacturing document. It's not an engineering document. So we've created that separation if it's an issue. And in companies with um, the ISO um, uh, certifications, there is a complete document structure and you can or can't. And, um, you know, if something changes in that document, it has to go for review. It has to go back through the process. It has to be approved. It's not a, a streamlined system. It's a system to catch errors, make sure that things are, um, uh, reproducible. yeah, re reproducible exactly is that whatever, um, uh, whatever went out the door as a product, has traceability, has uh, something that we can reproduce all the way through the process, not just at the manufacturing level. So let's let's go ahead and run this as the um, as the assembly, and I'll leave it up to you. If you want to turn in the part file, if you want to create the assembly, I have these files. So one of the conditions is that downside of the assembly, it's going to go look for this part. I now have a reference. This part is not consumed by the assembly. The part is still a separate document. The part is referenced, externally referenced into the assembly. And if I don't have that part file, then it will go look for it. All right. So if you um, if you create the assembly and you send me the assembly, that's going to be okay because I I have the original part files. I'm not I'm not worried about the file. Yeah. That's what it means. Uh, put a vice right there and then we can put the vice right. There. right. You can, yeah, and, and I have one of the things I'll put up is I have um, uh, a Curt 3600B uh, standard CNC vise as, a, as an assembly or a D675 or something. You can put the vise into the assembly. You could put the table into the assembly. You can build in geometry. If you have a custom fixture that you're building around it, all of that can be integrated in the assembly. So the assembly does have some definite advantages to, uh, to its process. Um, and, and getting that visual representation, when we make the setup sheets going to our operator, is going to be here's a here's a nice pretty picture of what I'm what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I'm not just you know going in blind. In most of my uh, job functions, I've been programmer, setup, operator. So if there's a problem as the operator, I go back and you know look in the mirror and say, hey programmer, why did you do that? And then as programmer me says, well you know it was a good idea at the time, but now that I've actually run it, and eh, not so much. You know, it's just that internal communication. Well, we don't have that internal communication when we're sending information downstream. And is it coming back? Is it something that um, uh, we're getting that full circle on? All right, so we need to save this. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it in the downloads. We'll, we'll create the folder and uh, catch up to it here later. Um, so this is still going to be, I'll go ahead and, well, if I can type. A1, and should have put my initials in there somewhere. That would have been, been helpful, so when I track it. <clears throat> well, I guess if we're going to add other models, such as devices, fixtures, yeah. uh, we ought to send you those files. No. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna. There's gonna be a crossover point. So, the question is, uh, do I need need your vice uh, uh, file to put in there? No, because SolidWorks will come up and say I can't find it. 
but the first piece that comes in, very first piece that comes in should be your part. And then whatever you put around it, when SolidWorks suppresses it, and uh, you know, do I really care about the vise? Do I really care about the, the plate, subplate, uh, fixtures, the sheet metal, whatever, you know, you can have the whole machine in, in, this, uh, in this assembly. SolidWorks is going to say, I can't find it. Okay, I don't care. Yeah, that's important to you, not important to me. Uh, what's important to me is you sent me this part, and I see tool pass, and that's what I'm grading, not what you brought in, you know, what you brought in addition to it. If that helps you, that's your choice. All right, so, um, you know, on that side, and then like I said, is um, uh, to make it simpler on the upload so we don't really have to create the zip files for the models for the everything else, we'll go ahead and just send me the assembly file and I will have, um, I'll have the original file and um, be able to, you know, take it off of my drive and have it load. Well, we want to make sure we use your file name. We don't if you make, well, yeah, that's the, name well, that's, that's that true. If, um, uh, if you draw your own model and give it a different name, then you probably have to send it to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Um, you know, throw a wrench in the machine right off. Um, so in that case, uh, you need to save uh, to generate the zip file. If you make your own, generate the zip file. Send me your model and the assembly so that I have both. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm guessing that um, there's not going to be a whole lot of inter inter interest in reproducing all of the solid models that you'll take what I give you in Canvas and work with it. And then if you have access to the vice models and the table models and all that, those will be things that you want to practice with, you want to have in your models. You can utilize them and I'll be glad to answer questions. You know, if you have any any issues with inserting them or mating them to the um, to the part, setting up your fixtures, I'll be glad to answer the, the questions on those. Um, but they're not going to be my primary focus or interest in, in grading for your assignment. Put it that way. All right. So, again, long, uh, long answer is uh, we're going to figure it out as we go. <laughs> All right. So we get into the, uh, to the assembly. The other nice thing about the assembly is I want to I generate that target sketch. And um, like I said, the, uh, the job portion, picking up our, our location, has gotten a lot better. Um, so where before we needed to generate more coordinate system, more information, um, unless there is a radius or unless there is other information, I don't really have to have a target, but I'll show it to you first so you know what I'm doing uh, when I generate one. Um, context, yeah, go ahead and turn off the warning. And I'm pretty familiar with that one. So just to make sure it's a fully defined sketch, And then my target is I want Y to be in that direction, X to be in that direction, and then select, okie dokie it. And then this is one of those, I made a change to the sketch. Sketch one isn't enough information and can't type apparently. Hit the caps lock, there we go, target. All right, so target being an origin, target being a kind of my generic term for, I created a, a point that will give me some information. So in this case, if I needed to put this off at 10 degrees for some reason, I could rotate this line and use it to pick, pick out my origins or my, my X and Y axis and, and then the origin of the part. So it gives me some, some additional functionality. All right. So sketches, um, if I needed a specific pocket, if I needed to draw um, lines or information in, I'm free to to do all of that out of the assembly. I can also do that in the part um, on its um, uh, on the uh, the part file in the uh, the feature tree as well. All right. So right clicking and going to new job is the same as hitting the job folder up here. Both of those will bring you into the setup. It shows me that this is milling, or we can pick for the turn mill turn. So mill turn being live C. And we're not doing uh, doing either of those. So the model is the selection. If I have a vice, if I have a table, if I have fixturing, it will probably find all of that in the geometry. So we can clear all of the selections, go back and pick 
just uh, the, the model that is uh, going to be machined. So it will kind of ignore everything else, make it not part of this, uh, the selectable entities. Stock then is relative size uh, box or fixed size cylindrical from the solid extruded fixed size tube. Basically, as long as we're not adding in any additional stock, um, we can add stock to all sides, add, add stock um, to top and bottom, and then all sides. Um, so if we're a millimeter over, my issue with adding stock, master cam, HSM, camera, all of them, is that um, I'm losing um, kind of those numbers that make sense. As the code's flying by on the screen and I'm expecting this to go out somewhere around eight inches and then it, it added the tool length in it or it added the, um, sorry, it added that uh, millimeter or 50 thousandths of stock, all of a sudden my numbers skew by 50 thousandths either way. They're not at my expectation. I'm not seeing something that I'm familiar with or recognizing. So if you need the additional stock, work with it, but watch the code. Watch that it's going to add to your C value, Z values. It's going to add, it's going to add that stock into the um, uh, considerations for the uh, for the milling in, in in certain axes. Would you do uh, if you have you know stock that you're always going to see for the sake of uh, clarity? Would you do all the surfacing and cut all the extra stock off the uh, the well, the operation or whatever. Um, it, it, well, it does. Yeah, the um, the the choice is that uh, we are including uh, the uh, the stock in the program, or that because I set uh, my origin at the edge of the part, when I get to the control, I'm going to do the the touch off on this edge. I'm going to put my edge finder on this edge, my edge finder on this edge. I'm going to come in the hundred thousandths or whatever for the probe. And then I'm going to go another 30 thousandths or another 50 thousandths, and that's going to account for the stock. When I touch off the, um, the, the probe or the tool to the top of the stock, I'm going to subtract another 10 thousandths. So question um, is answered by do I want to control that out of the system, out of the software, or do I want to control it at the controller or you know, put the values in at the controller and be able to manipulate it that way? So most of the time I prefer to go into the controller observe the stock condition, it's 50 thousandths over. So on this part, um, I'm going to go in 20 thousandths. Oh, I cut the other one and it's, you know, it's 100 thousandths. So I don't want to take 20 thousandths off this side and a quarter inch off of this side or whatever. I want to, I want to be able to manage that, go into the control and say, okay, back up uh, uh, 50 thousandths so that I can even that out. And it gives me more, more um, react reaction at the controller rather than having to come back to the software. Yeah, the issue that comes up that I've seen is my stock is not exactly square. Yeah, right. You know, I got crappy you, saw lines. You got stuff. a parallelogram trapezoid in one way, a parallelogram in the other way. There you go. <laughs> and uh, trying to model all of that or anticipating stuff. You're not going, it's, 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 not, it's not practical. If I can square it up and, and just as a model, I presume that it's already been squared and I have a, a known entity. Right. And that's part of your, your process control is that our decision, you know, our decision tree really starts with, we look at the material, what is the condition of the material, uh, what kind of tooling am I expecting, what are, you know, kind of those first five or six initial decisions going to steer me towards in, in making this part. Um, next is, am I going to do any manual operations or first operations? So like for this, maybe I would go ahead and skin it to size so that I can set it in the vise, touch off on this edge and clean clean the ends up and then do and then do a facing or do the facing operation, clean the ends up, and then go back and do all my drill and tap operations. And if that's my my setup, that's my choice, then uh, I can go ahead with it. If I decide that uh, this is a three quarter inch piece, I'm gonna take a one inch piece and hold on to it by a quarter of an inch and or uh, an eighth of an inch and face a, a 16th uh, 50 to 60 thousandths off the top run completely around the thing and then go do all those operations flip it over and machine that sacrificial material off the bottom that's another possible route to, to the decision and uh, or getting to the the end program um, where i think some of this other 
uh, other stock settings come in is if I have a casting and I know that my part is sitting in, inside of that casting, the casting should be from one to the next pretty consistent. So I could make a casting model as a, uh, an SDL file or as a, another entity bringing in um, that, uh, that part file, bringing in that information. And then instead of a relative size block, I'm going to say from solid. Since I've mated those two and I've kind of positioned my, uh, my finished machine part inside of that kind of current conditioning on the casting, I can use the, the from solid as this is the material that I have to remove. And all of the, the rest of this is gone. So it gives me a visual reference as to what I'm, what I'm really trying to machine, what I'm trying to get to. And so the uh, the work coordinate system then is so I okay make sure that I didn't change anything on the stock before I I um, collapsed it and under the uh, the choices um, previously it was origin and um, orientation which kind of locked you into your coordinate system your X Y Z coordinate system sitting on one corner without really the ability to rotate. And that was always problematic. So um, unless it was just in the orientation that I wanted to machine, I would generate a coordinate system. So one of the functions of the target was to put a coordinate system at the origin, give it an X direction, give it a Y direction. And then I would pick the coordinate system because it would force, no matter what else was going on, my work coordinate system, my 0, 0, 0, was where I put it in that coordinate system. Uh, in uh, 26. 2016, they added the Z axis and X axis, Z axis and Y axis, or X axis and Y axis. So I've leaned towards the X axis and Y axis because I can pick the face that I am setting the plane at, and then the X direction. Oh, no, I did that wrong, didn't I? Model and orientation? Uh oh, now I'm not sure what I picked. Well, let's go with the X and Y axis. We'll work back through them. So I picked the face. Let's go um, clear selection, clear selection. X axis. Come on. Make sure I'm picking the edges. And Y axis. Oh, I didn't. There's one thing that I still have kind of an issue with is it doesn't automatically progress to the next window. I think that would be something that Windows does that um, really this should do. Um, and then um, the uh, the origin, I'm going to pick a um, selected point, and then I can force it to the point. Reverse the x-axis, reverse the y-axis, and now I've placed that on the coordinate. So as it moves around or as it changes position, I can see that my z is in the right direction and that I've got um, I've got those coordinates where I'm, I'm expecting them. All right, we come down to the program name. It's expecting a number. Um, most of the time, since I'm not running production, uh, we're doing one-off jobs, I will just use program name one. Um, let's see, we're going to take, nope. And then the program comment, um, notice UTP, S1 for setup one, you know, some type of information. And then the work offset at zero is going to default to G54. The work offset at one will default to G54. So outputting the code zero or one will send you a G54 code. And we'll talk about um, one of the reasons that I program in G55. So most of my programs will be a number two because after we get past G54 being 0 and 1, the next one is G55, G56 would be 3, and so on. All right, so what you're doing is um, you're going to stay at 0 so that it outputs at G54. But there are um, tool change positions and things that go on in the older controllers that I found it's an advantage to leave G54 open um, and have it be my um, uh, reference for a tool change or a, a broken tool, tool touch off, those types of things. <clears throat> All right, I go ahead and accept it and I can highlight the job. There's my reference, there's the face that it's going to cut. 
now I'm ready to select operations. All right, so this is where uh, kind of out here in space somewhere lower, we're going to do a new operation. I'm going to tell it to go to 2D milling and I'm going to set up for a 2D contour. All right, so we're going to keep this first one kind of simple so that we can just run the ends. And again, my, I said my process is that I'm going to already have this to width. So six inches on the, uh, the width, and I'm going to set it in the vise with an end hanging over each side of the vise so that I can just clean up the ends. And then it's going to, you know, that's going to be um, establish the relation of all of the, um, uh, all of the geometry from there. All right, so first thing it's asking me is to go into the library. Um, so now this should be a little familiar. There is the part, there is the assembly. The asterisk is telling me that the assembly is the current document. If I already had tools in assignment one, I had already created uh, a tool list for another part and I wanted to duplicate it or reuse it, I would be able to acquire that information from the other parts and bring it into this part. Um, or what we're going to do is go, go in and make selections. So half inch, flat end mill, and select. So standard um, half inch flat end mill would be an inch and a quarter length of cut. This is either three quarter or one inch. So I'm pretty sure that I can just run down the end. I'm not going to worry about roughing it, stepping and repeating at this point. I just want to introduce because we have tons of parameters that we're going to get further and further into as we go. We just need to see some, some code going or uh, some uh, tool paths going across the screen and generate some code. So first one is, do we want flood, mist, through coolant air, you know, all of those things. Do you need to turn in any of that on? Um, spindle speed, um, surface uh, speed per minute, that's probably not too far. The limit is that, um, you know, is this a 7,500 RPM spindle? Is it the, the tool room mill at 4,000 RPM? Uh, is it a high speed at 12,000? Is it? 10,000, you know, somewhere in between, All right? So uh, that would be kind of the deciding factor. Um, a two or three flute carbide uh, end mill uh, would not um, would not bother me at uh, 1,000 surface feet per minute. The 4,000s uh, per feed tooth on one part, 92 inches a minute, that's a little daunting. I don't know that I want to run that, push the button, run that fast on a single part. If we were producing these all day long and uh, I could get a decent finish on the rough with it, okay, maybe. But realistically, if uh, we go to mid-range and say this is a 7,500 RPM spindle, I'm maxing it. And that puts me at 981 surface, uh, uh, surface feet per minute. And ramp spindle speed will be the, the same. Then the cutting feed rate, I'm going to drop back to more of a finish. 0 0.001 and see what it generates. So I'm hitting tab in between so it updates. 7,500 RPM at 22 and a half inches per minute. That seems a little bit slow, but there again, first, first run through, first article. I just need to get it done. I'm less concerned about 22 and a half than I am about 92. So let's go a little bit um, faster on the lead ends. And it's still not jumping the way that I'm expecting it to. So 30 and ramp, since we're not really doing those, but basically it just makes them consistent throughout. All right, so the other thing would be that if I'm using this tool more than once, my other consideration would be to go back into the library, edit that tool. And since that tool is no longer in the by type folder, it now is being added to my current document. Now I can go in and edit it. So tool numbers, descriptions, um, the, the cutter. Um, do I want the, the coolant on or off? Um, cutter description, so foot, foot length of one inch may be a, a little bit of an issue if I made the plate one inch. Descriptions for the holders. And unless we're in an interference, I'm really not concerned with the holder. You know, pick pick holders, but we get into multi-axis, uh, three, four, five axis where there's possible collisions. Then I want to see a little bit more with the holder and define that geometry a little bit better so it gives me some, some decent information. So here's all of the default numbers. 
So on the first go around, I decided, you know, 7,500, 22 and a half inches per minute is good, a good combination. Um, then I will set it out of the tool library for this part so that any additional is going to pick up those numbers and they're going to be added automatically. Um, so we'll, we'll bypass that, but we'll get into it um, before too long. <clears throat> so since this is one operation, uh, said so we're just going to feed in, run across, jump over to the other side, and call it good. All right, so now it gets interesting. We have all of these edges. We have all these faces to select. We have to start making some choices on how this is going to uh, to run. So I'm the I'm the guy that uh, with the mouse or with my finger I'm going. This is climb. This is conventional. This is this is climb. This is conventional. I'm thinking about which way I want to go, how I want to tell it to to do this. So when I pick the model, uh, I'm going to in most cases pick the edge first, and the edge is going to find its way all the way around because tangent propagation and pr propagate along Z are telling it I want all the edges that you can find along the base of that part. I turn off propagation. There are no radiuses in the corners for it to find its way around on the tangent. Not an issue. The other issue is that my little arrow in direction is inside of the part. So I have just blasted off a half an inch of the, uh, the part that I want to keep. First part that goes in, you'll reverse. Each, each of these items that I select will be uh, independently controlled on its, on its reverse. So basically this reverse is a toggle. I don't like the direction of the arrow. I'm going to toggle it the other way. I need to select. That one comes up correct. So I am climb and I am climb. What I, I would say as far as workflow, I would like to have the climb and conventional right here, right now when I'm doing the, uh, the reverse. Unfortunately, it's over here and our two little buttons that aren't really well marked. Left, left compensation, and right compensation. So at this point, if I were to switch from left climb milling to uh, conventional, it would reverse the arrows and I would have to go back and reverse it again. So I end up jumping between those two menus. So, you know, not a, not a deal killer. It's just not a, a great workflow. You know, I'll get over it one of these days. So that one was okay. That one was okay. If I have to go back and forth between those two uh, two tabs, I will. Because you pretty much know that you're going to be climber conventional. You know, kind of on. I know that this is a roughing pass. It's a uh, hard material. I would rather have the down pressure of a conventional. I'm not concerned with finish. I'm using a rougher. Whatever the conditions are, you you kind of know that you're going to go into conventional. You jump over to this set conventional, and then when you come back to the uh, the model selections, your arrows are being selected in relation to that conventional um, that conventional cut. Not really concerned about. We have a lot of a uh, lot of items left, um, but we're not really concerned about those uh, right now. So jumping to the next, we have depths, and these are set. These depths are set up for from retract height from stock top, from top, and so they're cumulative. All right, so the top from stock top is zero. We've set this um, as our element, and because we added no additional stock, it is also the same as the model top. And so they stay, you know, they're going to stay the same thing. If I go back and I add uh, a millimeter of stock, that's going to jump up a millimeter and, and change a little bit of the retract, change a little bit of... Um, the, the feed height because we're telling it to go from um, from top from stock top and oh, I'm just on it so watch out for the middle mouse wheel when you're in those it's going to cycle through your selections so this is saying from this add this and then from the retract height from here add that so the logic is is there. It's it's kind of a, a unique, unique way. I think it's a unique way of uh, managing it. Um, and then um, the other side is to go to absolute from origin. But now I've kind of gotten used to that um, adding things, and there are a few advantages to it. So um, few and far between, but there are. And so my retract height, I'm going to set it 0.9. 
or I'm sorry, the, uh, the clearance height at 0.9, my retract height at 0.1, and my feed height at 0.1. <coughs> so in adding those up, uh, the retract and the feed become the same number. And adding 0.9 to that gives me a 1 inch clearance plane. And then the retract is at 0.1. Those are numbers that I recognize and I'm used to. Okay, so we'll, we'll play around with those. And mainly what's happening visually, there is my 0.1 plane, and there is the 0.9 added to it. So I can see that there is some height being, um, uh, being created from going directly to the, uh, to the top of the stock. All right, and then from the contour, um, it's kind of underneath my uh, my timer there, but I don't want to run to exactly a razor blade edge burr on that bottom edge, so I'm going to send it past 30 thousandths. And I hit tab again, but basically the minus point, point oh three. We'll send it just a little bit deeper, and let's see if we go to control one, I will see that gap. So manipulating the view, being able to go in and, and say, yeah, there's a little bit more there. Um, my uh, machine plane uh, starts here, the, re, uh, the, uh, the, the feed and uh, retract, my clearance, all of those make visual sense to me. Um, I can go on to the next step. And then in the computer, like I said, was left compensation, right compensation. In computer <clears throat> is going to be zero center line, zero diameter tool, center line programming. All right, so even if it's a half inch tool, it's my responsibility to load up a half inch tool because the control, I've told it it's a half inch tool. The computer is going to generate a center line tool path that is a quarter inch off of that edge. It better be, otherwise we've taken too much material. Um, the um, in computer is also without compensation, so it's not going to initiate a G41, G42 step off of the part one way or the other. Uh, where, where will, where is going to add the G41, G42? So this terminology is is pretty much the same uh, that Mastercam uses, or at least very similar. In control says that I have a half inch tool. It's going to, the, the system, HSM, is going to produce code that says go to zero, go to eight, and turn on compensation. And if you have a reground tool and it uh, was a half inch and now it's uh, 480, you have to put 480 in the control, measure it, and then when it comps in to, to pick up that edge, it's generating that geometry on those, those values. And then off says just go straight down the middle of the line. And inverse where always is the one that um, I have the, uh, the most problem with. So there is our pop-up. That's basically your help. All right, so when you, um, when you hover over one of the items, so inverse there works just like where, except the where adjustment is entered as a positive number. Um, so where you would, uh, put in the, um, okay, when you put in the wear compensation here, but also outputs G41, G42. Come. Okay, going to have to ponder that positive direction thing or positive, uh, positive number thing. But pretty much we're going to stay, let's, let's simplify that down to we're going to stay in computer, and I won't move the mouse this time, in computer and where. And, um, Unless uh, you are using reground tools or have some some reason to be in control, we're not going to worry about in control just yet. Um, tolerances, four tenths of a thousandth tolerances, um, extensions, overruns, um, check boxes for multiple finish passes, depths. We have a lot more options that we can build into our uh, our simple contour. And then last is the uh, lead-ins, lead-outs. So I want to give this enough to, uh, to clear, so maybe a hundred thousandths. And then the angle is going to go to zero because this is going to be a straight. I'm not going to worry about arcing in. I'm just going to bring it straight on and straight off. And then the, um, let's see which one is, 
So the lead-in length is kind of uh, doing the extension where this one is picking up the radius. So one of the, um, the, the hardest things to get used to is that when we do this lead-in, you are going to see a switch from G17 XY coordinates to G18, um, G18 and G19 um, uh, YZ, XZ, depending on direction, which is actually um, has, has some advantages that if you're coming down to the part and it ramps in on that arc, it's a little gentler than just kind of running directly into the to the edge. So, but it is weird to see it, and the first time it does it, it's um, it's kind of a strange. It is kind of a strange lead-in. So we'll see it on the um, on the preview. Uh, we do have ramp capabilities, force entry positions, that kind of stuff. As soon as you hit the checkbox, it's going to calculate, and there is our our toolpath. So it comes down to the Top of the arc switches, goes in, and then that is the lead in amount, that is the toolpath. So uh, the arrow, the red is entry, the green is exit, and so deciphering the, um, uh, the colors on the screen, our starting position is on the right, uh, rapids to the 100,000th clearance, does the, uh, the feed and lead in, makes the pass, rapids out, rapids over, feeds down, comes across, feeds out. So that little red arrow and that little green arrow are really important to our process. We're doing those right and left side because it's in a vice of an unknown. Right, right. So yeah, that's the, we're not showing. If you want to run all the way around, you want to go through another process, that's fine. I'm looking for a contour with some uh, realistic settings. Not, you know, and and really, I'll I'll go ahead and say uh, that this is yours to experiment with. Uh, you give me a part that can be made. I will uh, I will look down through your operations. I'd be glad to make comments. And some of them I may chuckle at. Some will go, hey, that's a really good idea. I'm gonna steal that. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is the you know, just like the solvers, this is the place to experiment, make mistakes, ask questions, um, you know, push all the buttons, see what happens. There's there's few consequences here in industry. It's, wow, why do I have to replace the spindle? Oh, that was a really bad crash. <laughs> we don't like those conversations. All right, so I skipped over the facing. Um, let's go ahead and put a facing operation, and I'll just run it as a, a back and forth. So new operation, 2D mill face and then it picked up the library it picked up the previous settings so I ended up I didn't change in the library but if there was an operation in between the first and second it would revert to the the default numbers I'd have to change it again so that's the advantage of going into the library excuse me and um, and modifying the numbers at that that higher level um, stock contours, tool orientation, we're not concerned with. It's going to cut and overrun the whole thing. So 0 0.8, 0 0.2. One of the things we're going to do is determine some standard heights. If you want to do absolute, if you want to do um, the, the, the additive thing, then we'll go back and we'll set defaults in our system. I don't want to do that just yet uh, since we're just getting started, but we will go set some uh, defaults so that we can return to these values. So all we're doing is verifying. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and leave the 0.2 and the 0.8 since that's still going to be at one inch with a little bit more clearance. And then the facing operation is set by default to use 90% of the tool. 95% of the tool? Yeah, 95% of the tool. 90% would be 450. So a little aggressive, right? But we're just doing facing operation step overs. So something that we'd have to decide on. Uh, what are we going to do for the pass extension when it runs off the end? We'll give it another 50 thousands. Uh, let's see what else. Um, nope, not doing multiple depths. I clicked on that. Do we want to go one direction, both directions? So really um, going in both ways. The issue is how much um, uh, backlash do you have in the ball screws? 
you have loading in this direction it reverses direction We've unloaded, unloaded, loaded, unloaded, and we're going to get a little bit of a surface imperfection as opposed to picking up, coming back to the start, and going in the same direction. So the ball screws are loaded in the same direction, heights are loaded in the same direction. Um, a little bit cleaner surface. If I'm going to grind this or make it try and make it flatter, then I probably want to go in just one direction and not have that. And we're talking tenths of a thousandth very minor uh, surface but it's there uh, both waves from sides both sides are it's so don't really need to do anything there um, lead in is going to be fairly close and we'll go and accept and up over run back feed out all right so operation wise i want to um, to reverse it i can left click hold down and drag and now Order is face contour. All right, so that that's pretty convenient, just being able to kind of drag those locations. All right, so going back to the pattern, let's start with the uh, the quarter twenty, and oh, so I got the location. The pattern is a one inch by one inch pattern. So really didn't didn't intend to do the patterns. We could go through and select every one of these. Don't really want to go through and select every one of them, so that takes me to the pattern. All right, so whichever one we start with, new operation, drilling, drill. Uh, going into the library, we're going to find the um, any drill. Okay, so by type, any drill. And we're going to look down through here for 201 and select our 201. Picks it up, comes up to the speed, so 300 surface feet per minute. Um, maybe, let's see, 5700 on a 201. Um, that's not, that's maybe a little on the high side. Kind of like that one better. And I don't really need to take it out to two decimal places, so 3800 is good. Uh, feed rate. And down here we're at seven thousandths. I'll drop it back to five. So, you know, again, it's kind of personal preferences. Play with the numbers. Do they look realistic? If you don't know what's realistic, then get some numbers in and don't don't just trust what they've uh, they've thrown in here. We did the feeds and speeds with 200, so that's a good starting point. If I find that I can run this faster and, and feed it harder, great. I can always come back and change and always update it. Um, the whole location, I'm going to pick the uh, the bottom edge, bottom edge maybe, okay, and then um, we can, um, let's see, it didn't go to select same diameter because I picked the edge. Um, we'll, we'll play with picking the uh, the cylinder as opposed to the edge, but it needs to be able to find the uh, the same diameters. And then retract height 0.4, so that puts us at a 0 0.6, 0 0.2 above the part. And then uh, for the whole bottom, we'll go an additional 30 thousandths and drill tip through. That's not 30 thousandths, is it? And so it just has enough to go through. All right, so based on there's the edge of the hole at the uh, the bottom of the, the part. That would be the shoulder of a 118 degree uh, drill. So 135 degree being flatter, it's going to go through a little bit more. Not a big deal. And we're just telling it to make sure that it goes the 30 thousandths and then a little bit more. Okay, and then cycle operations, straight in, straight out. Well, let's go uh, go pecking, and uh, so chip breaking or deep drilling. Deep drilling is going to be G83. Chip breaking is going to be G73. G83 is going to be go to depth, come completely out of the, uh, the hole clear, go back in. Chip breaking G73 is going to be uh, perform the peck, come out about five thousandths to break the chip, go right back in. Not a full retract. So that's why it's saying partial retract. And then the pecking depths um, for the 200, well, I'll try 0.1. So basically, half uh, half D depth to diameter, and maximum pecking, um, and we'll go with uh, go with that. 
All right, so I'm going to set up one, my intention being to create that pattern. So next operation, drilling. Tapping is still drilling. Library tool um, by type. And so this is my, my favorite saying uh, for the last couple of weeks is this is the, the shampoo, lather, rinse, repeat. We're going to go through this cycle over and over and over. So it's just one of those, um, you know, get get used to it. Um, you know, once we get to this point, we're having to find um, the right hand tap um, by designation. It's going to be the um, I found the 216, so that should be the 1032 um, quarter by 0.05. All right, so some of them are going to be the decimal, so that's kind of a kind of an oddball, but um, so that should be a number 12 which don't do too many number 12s. Uh, so quarter uh, quarter 20, we'll go ahead and select. So I'm only doing the one. Um, again, with the uh, the 20, if I go 200, so basically taking the um, the thread pitch, adding a zero to it, that's going to return a an RP, um, the RPM of 200 is going to return a feed rate of 10. Want to go a little bit faster, I can double it. 400 will be 20. 500 will be 25, but I'm not calculating that. <laughs> so, you know, again, it's just kind of quick numbers as fast as the tapping and as many things as, as can go wrong. Uh, we'll start off on the uh, the slower side and work up to it. Can it take the cut? Can it clear the chip? Uh, this being a through hole, um, how far do we want to want to go through? All right. So the hole on this one, I'm going to go from the top of the model so that I can control its depth. Retract. Feed height is from the, the top, so we still have the 0.6. And um, yeah, we'll go from the uh, from the whole top to the uh, to the bottom. And pretty much, we told it we selected the uh, the top. Oh, since I'm picking just the edges, um, again, we're going to work into what happens when we pick the the entire cylinder as opposed to an edge. So minus um, 0.5. And that's what I need for my thread engagement. Tapping defaults to the uh, the G84. Shows me the um, the engagement into the part. And then if I want to see both of them, that'll overlay on top. In the solids, we're not going to get the um, the, the whole view necessarily. So if I go to wireframe, hidden lines visible, or we switch to well, then I'll see a little bit more of, um, of the toolpath. All right. So these two are going to be my pattern. Direction one is going to set where it's going to go. One inch. And then populate them out. Maybe not that many. And then direction two. Um, let's see, one inch. All right, since it's going that way and I don't see anything to reverse it, how about a minus sign? So some programs are going to accept minus, some are not. All right, so in this case, I'll go ahead and populate it out. We want to keep the original hole location. And, uh, well, there's not really uh, an order, preserve order, order by operation, order by tool. So we'll preserve the uh, the order, do the uh, the drill, and then come back and do the tap. So the pattern becomes a folder, and then there's certain things that we can do within the folder, uh, managing the, uh, the 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 two operations together. And then um, since this is highlighted in um, in black or the bold, it is now the current operation or the current folder. So if I go back and let's see, where is it? Um, make the default folder or is it current folder? Must be that one, default folder. That goes to bold. Now whatever I add will be outside of the pattern folder underneath the, the next level. New operation, drilling. I think we said that that was 516. So the issue with the, uh, the, the tooling plates is whatever you design, the first part you put up, on it will not line up with anything that you expected it to. So one of the uh, the issues is if I'm going to use quarter 20s, 
then I would like to have um, 5 sixteenths a little bit oversized so that I'm not running directly into if they're in line or they're offset I'm not running directly into the the tap size so for a 5 sixteenths uh, dowel pin we're gonna go with uh, the probably the 930 seconds maybe a little bit bigger So 281, let's see what we have above 281. Uh, L drill at 290, 10 thousandths would be a decent amount of engagement for a reamer. Okay, so I'll go with the, uh, the L. Um, again, with the 200 surface feet per minute. <clears throat> really don't need the decimals. And the feed rate at 11 thousandths, I'll stay with my 5 thousandths. So really for the, uh, for the drills going in aluminum, anywhere from about uh, 4 to 8 thousandths is kind of my range. Um, you know, 13, probably a little on the slow side. But, um, you know, again, getting it, getting it in, started seeing what the cutting conditions are, I can always speed it up later. Geometry. Same thing, I'm going to pick the through hole, retract height, subtract uh, 30 thousandths, and then drill through the, uh, through the bottom. Let's go, so it's going to add, add those numbers. And then staying with the full retract. Uh, so what is that? Um, that's going to be, so that's basically 25%. Yeah, that's not, not bad. It's kind of a weird number, but stay with it. And then new operation, drilling. We'll go in and see what we have for, for a ream. And the cupboard is bare. All right, so I haven't defined any reamers or we haven't built any, any reamers. So the question is, do I want to build a reamer? Or do I just want to go find a, um, a 5 sixteenths uh, drill? Oh, 290. Yeah, that would be about 20 thousandths. That may be a little bit heavier than I'd want, but um, yeah, it's still within in doable. That's what I get for doing math in my head again. So we'll set up for the uh, for the drill, and then select. Okay, so reamer is uh, half the, the speed, twice the feed. And um, so let's go 200, come up with, uh, with our numbers. We'll go a little bit heavy on the feed rate. So that being the case, I would uh, be about 1,200 at 40. Depth-wise. Still starting from the uh, from the top. I don't want my dowel pin to fall all the way through the uh, through the hole, even though it's kind of a tight ream. We'll probably put a plus uh, plus reamer in. So same thing. And we'll go um, yeah minus um, minus 0.5. And then this is going to be reaming with feed out so feed in feed out same um, same value unlike the other uh, boring operation say that again the, um, you don't want to take it all the way to the bottom you drill the hole all the way down yeah through. basically so the chips will fall through or anything that would gunk up uh, the the there's even a zip on the bottom of the hole pretty much um, basically the uh, the dowel pin that I put in here to bank my parts up against I want it to stop so that it doesn't fall that so that it doesn't fall through, but any chips or coolant has a a, a path to evacuate. Okay. And it's gonna the depth is only a half an inch. The lip is a half an inch. Yeah. Is that what you said? Right. Okay. And you know those are those are guesstimates at this point. I you know just pulling pulling numbers. If I have um, you know I go on McMaster and I find a box of uh, three quarter inch, then um, with a little bit of lead, um, they'll stick up about five sixteenths, maybe three eighths at most. Um, you know, just kind of 
you know, so it'd be one of those, I would fit it in there, take a measurement, go, yeah, it's deep enough, and then either adjust it or let it run. So same thing with the uh, the pattern, direction. I'll zoom out a little bit, and I'm just using the scroll wheel. So I'll make sure I get my direction. Hopefully I put these at one inch. And minus one again, since I picked the exact same edge. Populate it out. Accept it. And then some point I should save it. So I'm just going to add folder one, folder two. So if I was going to, I can single click, single click. And this will be the tap. And this will be the ring. All right, so we can name those, do whatever we need to them. And there's other things that if we wanted to show up in the program, do do whatever, uh, we can include those uh, those items. So from the uh, the job level, then we'll go into I prefer the uh, the stock simulation, and we'll slow this down quite a bit. The holder is being shown. Tool should be visible. Tool shaft, not so much on the holder. And wow, that was really fast. <laughs> I don't remember it kicking me out like that, not the uh, the job. Stock simulation, I not hit play. There we go. I hit something else. <clears throat> Why would you zigzag back and forth as opposed to the spiraling? Um, so just, versa, just standard. Okay, so flute lengths are set to one inch, so it's going to uh, to bark at those. All right, so we can we can speed those up uh, quite a bit. <laughs> um, so the uh, the zigzag standard face is set up to zigzag. Either we're going to go in one direction or face. Because typically we're not going to face with a half inch in mill over six inches. We're going to get the biggest face mill, fly cutter, whatever we can get, and it's probably going on, going to take two passes anyway. Um, in the case where we do need the face, or we could always change over to a pocket routine, which would, um, either in the adaptive clearing or in the, the pocket, have more of a spiral in, spiral out. So there's, there's choices, but the face operation kind of has that built-in, um, those built-in settings or that built-in, um, we're going to be using typically using a bigger tool than that you know one one tenth of the uh, the size of the part that we're running just to you know be able to load up tool. The other thing is for one part, do I really want to load ten tools when you know I can just get it done and move on to the next? All right. So my my question though is, um, why would you? To a spiral as opposed to oh, okay. So other than it being part of the operation, um, the the spiral um, is going to take longer. It's going to generate more lines of code. You would, um, uh, I don't know that I would I would choose the spiral uh, over the uh, over the zigzag in a in a facing operation. It's um, uh, I don't know that there is any uh, any advantage. It would be maybe if we're taking off a lot of material to get to that finished surface. We have a really thick piece or it's a rough piece. Um, the pocket might be a little bit better, but um, I don't I don't know that I would I would go spiral. Um, the other thing is I if I wanted continuous load, all right. So spiral uh, would lend itself to um, not loading unloading. And, you know, really the step over isn't as much. Uh, but in the case of a piece of stainless steel where this would potentially become a banana if I remove too much material from one side mm -hmm. and then it's inconsistent as I go across, um, the spiral and staying loaded would have maybe have more of a tendency to distribute that load over more of the part in or out. Yeah. You know, so... Internal stresses become an issue. Uh, material condition is, is an issue. Um, tool engagement, so where you want um, uh, the, the tool to stay embedded, you know, uh, the spiral has a better shot at. But even then, I would probably, instead of the, the pocket, because the pocket kind of steps over, 
I would generate the million lines of code with the adaptive clearing and let it take all of those passes and stay engaged. The, the, the benefit of Spiral is to allow it to do fine cutting, which if all you're doing is using two thousands, no big deal. No big deal. I mean, yeah, if you're taking half an inch and it's uh, it's you know our favorite piece of Inconel or something, then yeah, we want it want it engaged and cutting through, um, staying consistent on that load. Is the uh, surface finish going to look pretty much the same no matter which um, or you see an appearance? Um, yeah, with the spiral, you know, the spiral's pretty. <laughs> I don't know that there's any any more or less waviness in it. Again, if there's a lot of internal stresses, we're going to be, and we're taking that heavy of cut, I'm probably going to have to come back and take a finish cut to skin that last little bit and smooth it out anyway. Um, the other thing would be how much am I squeezing on this with, in the vise? We're going to do the demonstration where we put the torque wrench and, you know, the indicator and, you know, watch, watch the aluminum bow and, you know, and, and move around. So, okay, let me, uh, we'll finish this up.